Hi everybody. Thanks for worshiping with us today in our Acts of Faith community based in Rochester, New York. It's an exciting day, not, not only as we wish all of the, the dads and those who serve in a fathering role in our lives a happy Father's Day, but as we celebrate for the first time as a national holiday, Juneteenth, the day set aside for recognizing the end of slavery in this country. Juneteenth, which gets his name, its name as a combination of June and 19th, recalls how the states heard the news that President Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation to take effect on January 1st, 1863. But slavery continued in Louisiana and Texas for, for more than two years after the proclamation was signed because the word had not yet traveled there. Texas and Louisiana finally got the good news on June 19th in 1865 and former slaves broke out in spontaneous celebration. Those were very dangerous times. Even in the face of resistance and threat, the formerly enslaved African Americans found ways to give voice to the wide range of thoughts and emotions at the announcement of the end of legalized slavery in the United States of America. And today we honor the struggle of good over evil as a step closer to realizing the kingdom of God. As we will learn through worship today, living within the law of the land and juxtaposing that with the way of Jesus, that's been a struggle throughout history. So our centering question today, as we remember those who have taught us, influenced us in our lives, those who have fathered us in one way or another, even if they were no relationship to us, our question is this. Who was someone you know who taught you to stand up for what is right? Ready? Pause. Welcome to our worship service. Let us call each other to worship and invite God to join us. Please join me in reading aloud the bold print as you see it on your screen. Before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners. The law was in charge of us until Christ came. But now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. We come here today to learn more of the way of Jesus. Come, Holy One, and be with us here, for we long to be more like you. My Lord, what a morning comes to us from the African-American heritage of our nation. On this Juneteenth Sunday, let us sing together our opening hymn. Andy? stars begin to fall when 
stars begin to fall. You will hear the sinner cry to wake the nations underground. Looking to my God's right hand, and the stars begin to Please join me in our unison centering prayer. Almighty God, we come to worship you today with open hearts and open minds. We want to hear and receive what you have to say to us in this service. Speak to us today as you have spoke to those who went before us. Tell us the stories of your wonders and greatness. We are ready to hear them. Remind us once again of your grace and love. Help us teach your goodness to our children and the next generation. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians to counter the message of missionaries who visited Galatia after he left. Those missionaries taught that the Gentiles must follow parts of the Jewish law in order to be saved. But as you'll hear, Paul corrects that with a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. This is the good news version of Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Listen for how it speaks to you. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. It is through faith that all of you are God's children, in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Here ends the Spirit's message for us today. Thanks be to God. Today's sermon is going to be just a little different in its approach because I want to tie 
together three things, all of which are important. Lifting up Father's Day, of course, celebrating Juneteenth, but also relating it all to scripture. And to start us off, I'm going to include a second scripture reading in the body of my sermon here. I'm reading from the Good News Version of Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Have a listen as we keep ourselves open to the Word of God. Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Generasa, which is across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a man from the town who had demons in him. For a long time, this man had gone without clothes and would not stay at home, but spent his time in the burial caves. When he saw Jesus, he gave a loud cry, threw himself down at his feet and shouted, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus had ordered the evil spirit to go out of him. Many times it had seized him, and even though he was kept a prisoner, his hands and feet tied with chains, he would break the chains and be driven by the demon out into the desert. Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Mob, he answered, because many demons had gone into him. The demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on a hillside. So the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he let them. They went out of the man and into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs saw what happened, so they ran off and spread the news in the town and among the farms. And people went out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the man had been cured. Then all the people from the territory asked Jesus to go away, because they were terribly afraid. So Jesus got back into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged Jesus, Let me go with you. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Go back home and tell what God has done for you. The man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. This is such an incredibly interesting and profound story on so many levels. First off, this homeless guy who's possessed, he's been chained up, right? I mean, presumably by the townspeople who wanted to keep him maybe at a safe distance. They chained his hands and feet, and still he broke loose. And the demons inside him plead with Jesus not to destroy them, but to put them in the nearby herd of pigs. Okay, so pork and pigs were ritually unclean. So those herdsmen were most likely not Jewish, right? And yet the possessed man came from the town so he most likely was Jewish. The pigs, now possessed by the evil spirits, they run off the cliff and into the water where they all drown. And, and the, the men who normally tend to the pigs see all of this. So they run to the town and the farms to tell everybody what's happened. And then it says, People went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom all the demons had gone out sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Why were they afraid? Because of what Jesus had done? Because suddenly the man was healed? Maybe. 
Maybe they were afraid because they knew how to relate to him when he was possessed. They had figured out who he was when he was like that. But now, now he was healthy. Now he was different. And they didn't know what to do with that. It says, those who had seen it told the people how the man had been cured. And what did they do then? Well, it says that then all the people from the territory asked Jesus to go away because they were terribly afraid. Something happened. They had no explanation for it, and they were terribly afraid. Why? Afraid of the unknown, maybe? Afraid they couldn't control the narrative anymore? At any rate, they said no to Jesus and asked him to go away. And he didn't argue. He didn't try to explain. He didn't try to convince. He didn't try to convert. It just says, so Jesus got into the boat and left. What happened to the man next? We don't know. Was he welcomed back to his home? Did his neighbors welcome him back and throw him a big party? We don't know. Maybe they felt they could never trust him anymore. Maybe they it was too big a change for them and their interactions with him. Maybe he had to carry the stigma the rest of his life that he was, quote, that crazy guy whose demons killed the pigs. One thing we do know is that Unlike many, many, many other times when Jesus heals somebody and then tells them not to tell anyone, this time he tells the man to go back home. Tell what God has done for you. It's like he wants him to become sort of a his own prophet or something, you know, a truth teller. And it says the man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. So hold your thought about that for a minute. And let's talk about Juneteenth. On January 1st, 1863, so the Civil War is still ongoing, President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect. In preparation for that, watch night services had been set up all around the country, especially in black communities but also in places like Rochester and anywhere that there were large abolitionist enclaves. Watch night services are sometimes also called Freedom's Eve services, and they are Christian religious services held on New Year's Eve and associated with a celebration and remembrance of the enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation. Maybe some of you have been to those. So all of the enslaved people had been legally freed as of that date, that January 1st, 1863 date. But in Louisiana and Texas, the word never got out. I'm not here to talk about why or how that happened. But it was never shared with people of color. And for more than two years after the proclamation was signed, the African Americans in those states remained enslaved there. The U.S. Army finally took the news into Texas and Louisiana on June 19, 1865, and spontaneous celebrations broke out. That's the history of Juneteenth. Now, I will tell you that many of my friends with beautiful brown skin do not find much to celebrate on Independence Day, July 4th, because they weren't included in the Declaration of Independence or the original Constitution. But Juneteenth? That is a day to celebrate. For all of us to celebrate, really, because it marked an end of slavery, at, at least that method of enslaving people. The Galatians reading from Paul, it's all about God's law versus the laws of the land where we are living. 
Paul says to the early believers, and to us, by the way, Before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners, until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law, that's capital L, was in charge of us until Christ came, in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. Now, I would add here that his use of the word law is both the law as it applied to Jewish believers in Hebraic history, but also to law in general, as in God's law. Christ came to fulfill that. We still have to abide by the laws of secular government, according to Luther and Calvin and other, you know, Protestant reformers. But we need to look to change those laws so that they are more ac so that they more accurately reflect the law of God, the way of Christ. It is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. Fancy words for, for saying that when we become believers and are baptized into the faith, we become grafted onto Jesus. It's like we, we put on Christ and wear his truth. We, we wear his values. We are clothed in him. And Paul goes on to say that because of that, there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. If we belong to Christ, then we are part of God's covenants. So what happens when the law of God, the one who says we are all one without distinction, comes in conflict with the human-made laws of the land? What is our responsibility? I think of the people, the men and women of good faith, who justified enslaving people by the use of scripture. They thought they were doing the right thing. Yet we know now that enslaving someone is not in keeping with the teachings of Jesus, right? There is neither slave nor free. No division, no separation. At the time of Paul, there was no greater separation among early believers than, than that between Jew and Gentile. In fact, the argument almost split the church before it ever really took root. Huge argument. Could someone become a Christ follower without being Jewish first? But the teachings of Jesus won out. The ones that said that everyone is equal, that we are all made in the image of God. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. And just as an aside then, I mean, I have to ask in the 21st century, if, if there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, no difference between enslaved and free, no difference between men and women, then do we also agree that there is no difference between foreigner and native born? No difference between immigrant and citizen. No difference between gay and straight. And if there's no difference between men and women, isn't that the ultimate in gender fluidity, in non-binary thinking? We may have traded some of the titles and the, the classifications, but Aren't we all looking to identify the one who doesn't fit, who isn't like us, and shackle them to, to keep them where we don't have to see them and be challenged? 
don't we all try to take the things that are distressing and chain them up out of sight so they're out of mind? People, ideas, dreams. And then when someone has the nerve to get healthy on us, to be a real truth teller, or to demonstrate the pureness of who they are, like the man after the demons have been exercised, do we trust them? Do we trust their message? Do we listen to them? Or are we just annoyed? We get annoyed with them because they're reminding us of something we don't want to have to deal with. I don't know the answers to these things. And, and I think that's part of God's desire. I don't think we're supposed to know all the answers. That would be too easy. What I think we are supposed to be is challenged. Challenged in our faith and in our values. I mean, how else will we grow? But right now, people are so afraid. They're of changing demographics, of things being different, of losing control, of power or status, that they're creating man-made laws that they think will protect them or will grant them some sort of privilege or something. Without a doubt, my dad was one of the greatest influences in my life. I won't go into all the professional things that led him to be named to important people listings around the world. But just a couple of things as a father. The first happened when I was a little girl. I was about three or four. We were in the yard together and he said, stretch your arms out and swing around. And I did. He did the same thing. We must have looked like a couple of whirling dervishes out there. And then he moved closer to me. And I knew we were going to collide. So I stopped. Why did you stop? He asked. Because we were going to hit each other, I said. And I got the biggest smile from him as he picked me up and he said, That's right. You and I can spin all we want. But we both have the right to not get hit. If I kept going, I would have hit you. If you had kept going, you would have hit me. We can keep swinging our arms as long as nobody else is within reach. But as soon as they are, we either have to stop swinging or go somewhere over there where, you know, we won't be near each other. And the same is true for anybody who wants to swing their arms near you. I never forgot that because it came back into discussions about human rights and civil rights and women's rights and gay rights. And if he were here now, he would apply it to trans rights and immigrant rights and any others. But in, in this country, we have a history of trying to tell other people where or how they can swing their arms as if them doing something over there were, were really to bother us over here. We all have the same rights, but, but clearly we haven't all been given the same space to exercise those rights. The other thing that stands out for me today as I think about him, something else I learned from my dad. Well, when I was a teenager, I was doing a lot of questioning about my faith. Well, about God in general, I think. I think it's probably when I was first introduced to um, fundamentalist uh, evangelicals and he just looked at me one day and he said you know Deb God created you and gave you your brain if your God isn't big enough to handle your questions you need to get yourself another God another God what did that even mean but I learned I learned over time that nothing limits God or Jesus or the Spirit except us when we try to create God in our image instead of embracing that every one of us, everyone, without distinction, is created in God's image. And that includes our laws and how we use them. 
It all boils down to law versus the laws. And I, for one, opt for the law that Jesus came to fulfill as opposed to the laws that we often use to exclude. With all of that in mind, then, I wish, wish you all a happy Juneteenth celebration. And I say, Happy Father's Day, Papa. And thank you. Amen. On this day, when we lift up those who have protected and nurtured us, those who have guided us in the best sense of God the Father. We also recognize the work we still have to do in order to form a more perfect union and the role that the church is called to serve in that work. This is a time in our service when we offer both ourselves and our gifts as we pledge to move forward in faith, walking the way of Jesus. Jesus, you came to bring freedom and to set our sights on living as God calls us to live. We dedicate these gifts and pledges to you and ask that you use them to bring about your reign on earth through the work of this church. Amen. something a little different with our prayer time today and I've asked my sister Sonia Kennedy who is clerk of session at South Presbyterian Church 
to join me in leading us in this extended prayer and celebration of the day. Holy and righteous God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us like those of generations before us who resisted the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere to the glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred that infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And through our struggle and confusion, work to accomplish your purposes on earth so that in your good time, every people and nation may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Jesus, in your name, receive our prayer. Out of the darkness we cry to you, O God. Enable us to find in Christ the faith to trust your care, even in the midst of pain. Assure us that we do not walk alone through the valley of the shadow, but that your light is leading us into life. Jesus, in your name, receive our prayer. O God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. Jesus, in your name, receive our prayer. O oh God, call us into a deeper relationship to be your church for the sake of the world. Help us to see with new eyes the injustices within church and society. Call us to have a loving heart that respects and uplifts the humanity and dignity of every person. Open our ears to listen to and learn from the experiences of all people. But in this country especially, people of color. Open our mouths to speak up about injustices. Join us with others to work for racial equity and inclusion for all people, we ask. Jesus, in your name, receive our prayer. O oh, Holy One, we ask that you be with us on this day. We hold certain individuals in our heart today and we offer them to you and we give thanks for their love, their support, their teaching, their training, their protection, for modeling for us how to be faithful. But we also hold in our hearts our brothers and sisters of color and all others in this country who have felt burdened by laws that were unjust. We recognize, God, that those laws still exist today. And we ask that you give us the eyes to see them and the strength to fight them. Give us the will to change them, to help to make this place a more perfect union one that more rightly reflects what you wish to have be here as your kingdom come. 
But we pray this, Jesus, in your strong name and with one voice we say together, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Sonia. Let us now stand, if we are able, even in our own homes, in honor of this national holiday, as we sing together, lift every voice and sing. Andy? Today we give thanks for the truth-tellers, those among us who 
are healthy and connected to the Spirit, even if we don't like what they're telling us. We give thanks because they remind us that in Christ Jesus, we are all one. We all matter. And we are all worthy. Each one of us, regardless of skin color or other condition, is better off for remembering and lifting up our history. Because if we don't remember it, we will be more likely to repeat it. And we really don't want to do that. Instead, let's celebrate our oneness and our unity as travelers on the way with Jesus. Let's remember to live out the values of our faith more than the values of our fears. And let's celebrate those men and women who have protected and guided and taught us how to be the men and women of faith that we are becoming. Go with peace, my friends. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here, and we are glad that you chose to worship with us. We are grateful for your prayerful support of our ministries. We are a small congregation of about 50 members in upstate New York.
but now we find ourselves growing to include some of you in North Carolina, Connecticut, Florida, Kentucky, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and other parts of New York State, and maybe other places that we are not even aware of. All of us united by the spirit of the living and loving God. If you are watching this, we already think that you are part of us, and we would love to hear from you. Should you find yourself in the Rochester, New York area, we would welcome you to worship with us in person. Please check our website calendar for the nearest location. If you would like us to pray for you, please send those joys or concerns to me through our website, which is noted at the end of this video. More worship services, as well as our weekday meditations, prayerful pause with the pastor, can be found on our YouTube channel, South Church Rochester. If you are in a position to help support us financially, your gifts may be sent to us as seen on your screen. We hope that you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you back here again. Just remember, transform your spirit, transform our world. Okay, God bless, and bye for now.